Okay, hi! In this lecture, we will be discussing about microbial biosafety in the laboratory. So, the outline for this topic today will be uh, first discussed about um, this group classification, followed by uh, bio a brief overview of the biosafety levels established in the laboratory. So, we have the basic laboratories for biosafety levels 1 and 2, the containment laboratories for biosafety level 3, and the Maximum Containment Laboratory or BSL-4. Afterwards, we will also look at biosafety cabinets and what are the designs of the different biosafety cabinets that we have. Lastly, we will, think, uh, we will talk about uh, disinfection and sterilization of usually surfaces and what are the uh, possible chemical solutions that we can use. So first, let's discuss about the risk groups. So when we talk about biosafety, the first thing that, we, that comes to mind is my, uh, the laboratory biosafety. And in the laboratory, uh, we usually uh, we tend to handle, especially if it's a biology laboratory, we tend to handle, um, uh, for biological materials, we tend to handle microscopic organisms. So, and aside from that, also pathogenic organisms. So when we classify risk groups, we think about um, what are those agents that can cause diseases? So one of the first basis of classifying the agents that we handle in the lab into risk groups is, of course, the pathogenicity of the organism. So basically, uh, we want to know, uh, is that uh, organism dangerous or not? Because the basis of that, uh, looking into uh, the pathogenicity, the, is it uh, this is causing? Uh, will tell us whether it's it should be in a higher risk group or in a lower risk group. Next is the mode of transmission. Uh, is it easy to transmit? Uh, is it as far as simple touch or inhalation? Or is it, does it do we need to have uh, a more um, uh, intimate uh, mode of transmi transmission such as uh, blood, uh, through blood uh, or intravenous blood fluids? So, what is the mode of transmission and what is the range of its host? Is it only for the humans or is it only for, uh, for example, uh, can it be uh, transmitted also to uh, other animals such as monkeys, um, cats, birds, etc. So, the mode of transmission or classifying it uh, on the second basis, which is the mode of transmission, is influenced by existing levels of immunity in the local population. So, uh, whether this population is immune to a certain, for example, um, le uh, I'll give the example of the smallpox in, uh, way back in the uh, time of the explorers. So, smallpox had been prevalent in uh, medieval Europe uh, since a long time ago. But uh, during the time of the exploration of Columbus and uh, the exploration of the New World, the, uh, the explorers or uh, eventually the pioneers that uh, traveled onto America carried with them the smallpox virus. But since they have had, uh, their population have had the smallpox for a long time and they have developed herd immunity in the, with them, when they went, uh, they are not necessarily sick with smallpox, but when they went to the New World, the natives there had never had smallpox before. So the tendency is that they transmitted the, uh, the smallpox could be, uh, during that time, is, uh, might not be as high risk to the European population, but it's a very high risk to the Native American population. And actually, this is also one of the reasons why uh, we are afraid of smallpox right now because, um, or rather, smallpox is quite high risk right now. Uh, way back, I think it's in the 1980s or 1970s, uh, there was a worldwide um, vaccination of smallpox in an effort to eradicate smallpox. So, uh, in order to eradicate that specific disease through vaccination, basically, you need to immunize each and every person in the world and uh, and in doing so the uh, possible you are um, uh, for uh, basically you are um, you are uh, withholding smallpox the smallpox virus of host for several generations actually a generation or two uh, unfortunately that generation was before us so right now um, our generation has no immunity to smallpox. But that is fine because apparently because of these steps that was done 
uh, generation ago, uh, the smallpox, there is no, supposedly no, there should not be any wild type smallpox existing in any popula- in any human population right now. So basically, the only small, the only source of the virus would be in the laboratory. And if there are any um, unknown sources of smallpox, for example, um, there was a smallpox, just uh, hypothetically speaking, uh, if there was uh, a corpse of a person that died of smallpox that was frozen in a glacier, and then that glacier thawed, and it infected uh, the local community, well, that will be an outbreak of smallpox. So anyway, um, right now, we don't, um, have immunized against smallpox because apparently, as far as we know, the only the only smallpox virus uh, existing in the world is inside the laboratory. So anyway, that's for um, immunity in the local population. So density and movement of the host population, especially now in the global uh, globalization, when the uh, COVID outbreak started started in China. So uh, it was during the time of uh, the holidays, near the holidays. And almost the spring festival where most of the Chinese people tend to travel. And because of the globalization of eco- the globalized economy of the world, well, it easily spread into be- and became a pandemic. So aside from that, presence of appropriate vectors. So aside from a human vector, how, el- how can it travel? As for example, malaria or uh, dengue. So we have the vector here, an human vector, which is the mosquito. So, it can spread through the mosquito and also uh, the standards of environmental hygiene. So, is, that, uh, is the community uh, a high, uh, rather a high uh, economic class community or is it in a lower economic standing where uh, there is a low, usually uh, the hygiene because the hygiene standards in um, a community that has a lower economic uh, class has tendency is actually a lower hygiene. So uh, basically, oh, I'm not just I'm just I'm not categorizing it, but usually we by observation only. But anyway, uh, that is um, you have your uh, standards of hygiene because of course mode of transmission, uh, especially now. Uh, an example is the today's pandemic. So you have uh, in uh, when you go outside, you always tend to wear video alcohol. And even in um, establishments, there's always, uh, when you go inside the establishment, the guard always sprays alcohol on your hands. So that is uh, to implement st- uh, standard hygiene practice. And also to prevent transmission of disease. So the third basis is the local availability of effective preventive measures. So if the treatment is available, it becomes lower risk because even if you do have the disease, you can get well from that disease because you have a proper treatment or even an effective preventive measure such as a vaccine. However, if you do not have a vaccine or there is no cure for that disease, it becomes a high risk. So, the local uh, preventive measures may include uh, prophylaxis by immunization or administration of the antisera such as, well, uh, passive immunization, sanitary measures such as food and water hygiene, control of animal reservoirs or arthropod vectors, basically insect vectors. And the last basis is the local availability of the effective treatment. So as I was saying, if there is a cure for the disease, it becomes a lower risk. If there is no cure for the disease, it becomes high risk. So the effective treatment includes passive immunization, post-exposure vaccination, and use of antimicrobials, antivirals, and chemotherapeutic agents. So those are the basic basis of classification of risk groups. Basic, actually, um, the risk groups can vary, uh, or rather, uh, assigning a certain pathogen to a risk group can vary in a, in a region or in a country, depending on, of course, basis number three and number four, availability of preventive measures and availability of effective treatment. If it's in a region where there's no effective treatment or the, 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 basically the community was not immunized properly, uh, it becomes a high risk. If it's uh, in a community or region that has a good healthcare system, all of, the, all of the constituents are immunized and they have a good healthcare system that, such that um, if, if a disease breaks out, 
uh, they can get properly treated, it becomes the risk becomes lower. So, sorry. So we have here um, risk group classifications. So uh, basically, these are uh, based on this basis. We have actually four risk groups. Uh, this is from WHO. So risk group number one is uh, described as no or low individual and community risk. Basically, this is uh, a microorganism or an agent that is not likely to cause human or animal disease. Example, bacteriophages. We tend to have handle bacteriophages in the lab. Uh, e. coli. Although E. coli can be a, a relatively uh, moderate risk. Um, basically, um, some cultures that are not exact, not pathogenic at all. So, risk group number two is a moderate individual risk or a low community risk. So, it describes a pathogen that can cause human or animal disease, but it's not likely to be a serious hazard to laboratory workers, to the community, livestock, or the environment. So, even uh, it can cause disease, but uh, it's uh, basically treatable, something like that. So, it's li unlikely to be serious. So, for example, um, it can just cause an outbreak of acne. So, laboratory exposures may cause serious infection, but effective treatment and preventive measures are available, and the risk of the spread of infection is limited. And then, for risk group number three, this is high individual risk, but low community risk. So, this is a pathogen that usually causes a serious human or animal disease, but does not ordinarily spread from one infected individual to another. So, effective treatment and preventive measures are also available. So, examples here in risk group three, uh, HIV and mycobacterium tuberculosis can be classified as risk group number three. So there is, um, it can cause serious ailment, but the mode of transmission is not really. Although in with regards to mycobacterium tuberculosis, it's easy because um, uh, it uh, it transmits through aerosols. But um, because of the availability of my uh, treatment, it becomes a lower risk. So it's classified as risk group three, except for the strains that are. Uh, resistant to antibiotics. So this group number four, it is high individual and community risk. So this is described by a pathogen that usually causes human, serious human or animal disease and that can be readily transmitted from one individual to another directly or indirectly. So effective treatment and preventive measures are not usually available. An example of an agent in risk group number four are the uh, Ebola virus. Usually, the viruses, uh, most of the people or the, the pathogens or the agents in, the, in this group 4 are the viruses. So, we have uh, the Ebola virus, which is a very high mortality. Uh, it causes a high mortality hemorrhagic fever. Basically, the, the uh, one strain has a 90% fatality rate. So, that means uh, one, only 1 in 10 people can survive that type of fever so that is a very high risk group so those are the four risk groups that we have so uh, because of these uh, risk groups basically we the, the laboratory practices and the mitigation controls that we have are based primarily on how or on the risk groups that we have basically um, we tend to uh, craft or we tend to design laboratories, procedures, uh, and practices based on the capability or the, the organism or the risk group that that uh, laboratory will be designed to handle. So, for example, uh, we have your uh, risk group 1 usually done in BSL. Level uh, by safety laboratory one, so the basic laboratories, usually for teaching and research. So, well, actually we have the uh, that type. I think up until by safety level two in the in uh, Mapua, especially in the research center, uh, YGC, in the YGC uh, building we have I think BSL two, and then in our uh, biology laboratory is BSL one. So, uh, laboratory practices, general uh, laboratory practices. Um, and then for the safety equipment, uh, open workbench is fine for uh, risk group number one. Although we have a laminar hood in our uh, biology laboratory in the fourth floor of the north building. But uh, in the YGC building, we have, in the biology laboratory, we have biosafety cabinets there. 
So, uh, the next level that usually is, uh, the Bio Safety Level 2 is designed to handle risk group 2 organisms up until risk group 2. So, the laboratory that usually have the BSL Level 2 are the Primary Health Services Laboratory, Diagnostic Services, and the Research Lab. And that is why uh, the YGC, which is a research laboratory, is uh, designed for BSL 2. So, you have here, aside from general laboratory practices, you have um, uh, protective clothing and some biohazard signs. So, the equipment here, you have open bench and also a biosafety cabinet is a must starting BSL Level 2. That is for risk group 2 because again, risk group 2 <coughs> con uh, contains moderate risk to an individual. And then we have the containment biosafety laboratory. These are special diagnostic and research lab. As far as I know, we ha only have a few here in the Philippines. One is at our ITM, uh, Research Institute in Tropical Medicine. Right now, it's the one... Uh, that handles or the head laboratory for handling uh, the COVID um, testing center, the RT-PCR and COVID testing. So it is the highest containment laboratory in the Philippines. So it's a level two. So basically, uh, as a le it's you apply level two, basic uh, BSL level two, plus special clothing, controlled access, and directional airflow. Basically, aside from uh, the PPA. Uh, the the access in sections of the laboratories specially controlled and uh, you will see there uh, rooms that are either negative uh, negative uh, air pressure or positive air pressure you want to control what goes in and what goes out especially for the infection so for the equipment you have the BSCs and other primary devices for all activities and then the maximum containment biosafe maximum containment for biosafety level 4 is designed to handle risk for groups, which is the highest risk and high community risk. So basically, they are the ones that handle dangerous pathogens. So most bio uh, BSL 4 are either military uh, installations or uh, very, um, very specialized research uh, institutes. So it's a level 3 plus airlock entry, shower exit, and special waste disposal. So, they are using class 3 biosafety cabinets in conjunction with class 2. And as you will see, the, the personnel there are uh, doing, uh, basically, they are uh, in a positive pressure suit. So, those are uh, the risk levels and usually, uh, how do you, uh, how it uh, connects to the BSL uh, biosafety levels that we have. Basically, the risk group 4 corresponds, the number corresponds to basically the biosafety levels. Now, let's look at what exactly are these biosafety levels in the laboratory. So, here is a summary of the biosafety level requirements. So, we have uh, for isolation, isolation uh, of the laboratory, basically environmental and functional isolation from general traffic. So, the laboratory must not be uh, accessible to the general public. It should not be uh, aside, uh, in, it should not be located at the roadside. Basically, it should be located in, uh, in a relatively remote community or in a community where there is a large distance or, uh, well, basically fencing between uh, the laboratory and the general community. So, biosafety levels 1 and 2 doesn't really require that much isolation, but Levels 3 and 4 requires that isolation. So you have uh, sealable rooms for the contamination. 1 and 2 does not require it, but 3 and 4 require it. Basically, these are sh shower rooms that, uh, that decontaminates or that basically clean, uh, sanitizes people going in or going out from the lab. So in the ventilation, so basically in biosafety levels, you do not want the pathogen to... Uh, go out of the lab and infect the community. So the ventilation is surely uh, a negative pressure inside. So you want to keep the pathogen inside. So it's an inward airflow. And then, of course, the ventilating system must be um, properly uh, controlled with HEPA-filtered air exhaust. So biosafety level 1 doesn't need that. Biosafety level 2, it's optional. But basically, it's desirable because you have a moderate risk. But it does, it's not basically a requirement, but the ventilation is a requirement for 3 and 4. And then for double door entries, again, 1 and 2, the basic lab doesn't need that, but uh, double door entries is required for 3 and 4. So what are double door entries? Basically, when you look at laboratory, we divide 
areas of the lab as uh, the clean and the the clean, the gray, and the dirty area. The dirty area is basically the the where where the pathogen, the the main lab where the pathogen is, where you basically handle the pathogen. In between the clean area and the the, the hazard area, the dirty area, you have the gray area. So basically, this is where uh, the contamination are usually done. And that's why we need to have a double door entry. Uh, the entry to the gray area and the entry to the actual laboratory. So that is required for a biosafety level 3. So airlock. Airlock is required for uh, basically biosafety level 4. It's not really required for biosafety level 3 because, um, well, there is still a lower community risk. But for biosafety level 4, because of the high community risk, it is required. So, airlock with shower is required again with BSL-4 for the same reason with the airlock. Having an anteroom is, of course, uh, not required for biosafety level 1, but required for uh, biosafety level uh, 3, actually 3 and above. So, anteroom is basically uh, a room prior to the uh, laboratory. So, anteroom with shower, of co uh, basically, it's a yes or based dependent on the location. So, having a, a shower in the anteroom, basically, the, the thing here is that you want to prevent outside contamination from entering. So, this is desirable if uh, what is what you are handling in the laboratory is a very sensitive uh, agent, biological agent that's very sensitive that it should not be infected with the outside. Uh, as opposed to having a dangerous agent in the laboratory that it should not effect, should not have an effect on the outside. So basically, for having an anteroom, it protects what is inside the laboratory uh, versus having um, a double door, which protects what's uh, what's at the outside from what is you are handling inside. Anyway, uh, effluents. You need to treat the effluents. Any outflow, outflow of air, even water outflow of water should be treated of course in biosafety level 4 and desirable in actually biosafety level 3 depending on the agent so biosafety level 3 for example if you are handling um, tissue samples stem cells they are very uh, sensitive biological agents that are um, prone to infection from the outside so the tendency is of course to to protect what is inside the laboratory. So, we have autoclaves, on-site autoclave. Uh, autoclave is, uh, can, well, it's a desirable uh, factor in BSL-1. On-site autoclave is desirable also in BSL-2. But, um, it, is, it is required. It's a requirement in BSL-3 and 4. So, on-site autoclave, basically, you have autoclave in the lab or in the vicinity of the laboratory. It can be on the cleaning room or sanitation room, etc. So, a double-ended um, autoclave uh, means that uh, you have an autoclave. Basically, you have a double-door autoclave. One for uh, a door uh, opening to the inside of the lab and another one opening to the uh, to an to an outside chamber. And then, uh, for biosafety cabinets, it is desired starting level 2, but it's required starting level 3. And of course, personal monitoring capability you should know who enters and exits the lab. It is required for BSL level 4, desirable in BSL 3, but not necessarily required in BSL level 2. Basically, for example, um, your classmates can enter the laboratory, biolaboratory, uh, without much permission, although this is not really uh, applicable in the in in our school because, uh, you, of course, you need to have proper permission. You cannot just enter lab, the bio laboratory of when your friend is uh, conducting classes there. So anyway, uh, that those are some some summary of the biosafety level requirements. Now let's look at the basic laboratory biosafety levels. So biosafety level one is suitable for work involving well characterized agents not known to consistently cause disease in immunocompetent adult humans and present minimal potential hazard to laboratory personnel and the environment. 
So BSL-1 laboratories are not necessarily separated from the general traffic patterns in the building. So basically, for example, uh, our biology laboratory is located, although it's at the end of the uh, north building's fourth floor hallway, but still, it's, st uh, it's basically roadside, it's easily accessible. So work is typically conducted on open bench tops using standard microbiological practice. Basically, it's uh, standard aseptic techniques. Special containment equipment laborator, uh, special containment equipment or facility design is not required but may be used as determined by appropriate risk assessment. For example, you want to handle a risk 2 group in a BSL-1 laboratory. You need to have um, proper uh, basically facility. Your facility must be able to handle. You can, be, you can upgrade your facility or for example, uh, you can use... Um, uh, if your BSL-1 has a biosafety cabinet, uh, you can actually handle risk group 2. You just need to uh, change or uh, give proper or additional protocols in handling um, the risk group 2. Another example here is um, in, the, in today's pandemic because of the need for testing. And there are only a few BSL-3 laboratories uh, we have. So the the tendency is that the the BSL level two laboratories, which are many because it's, it's a research lab, so many institutes, even our university has one. Uh, they uh, they authorize because at that time it was risk group three, although COVID right now is risk group, yeah, it's risk group three still. So uh, anyway, basically you have your. Um, your laboratory, uh, they authorize BSL level 3 to handle the risk group 3 pathogen, which is the COVID virus, or rather the uh, samples from COVID virus is for the sake of uh, RT-PCR work because we need a lot of testing centers. Now, this, um, as long as you prepare proper um, mitigation control, such as uh, you upgrade the procedure, you change the procedure, so as to effectively handle the virus or the the uh, the samples containing the virus. So basically, you can elevate uh, your BSL two to BSL, not ex not truly BSL three, but uh, say two point five. So a BSL two laboratory that can handle a risk group three. So you you need to have special containment, or you need to have a special um, procedural protocols to be able to safely handle it. So anyway, um, having uh, the design of the laboratories and protocols, always keep in mind that what exactly is the pathogen that you are handling and how you can prevent that pathogen from infecting you or your pe the people around you or uh, escaping to the outside environment. So BSL-1, since it's handled, is group 1, which is not really dangerous. So there is no, uh, no, um, no, not much risk to handling much. So basically, uh, the safety measures are it's in the lowest type of safety measures. So laboratory personnel must have specific training in the procedures conducted in the laboratory and must be supervised by a scientist with training in microbiology or a related science. Of course, not, on, not just anyone can enter or uh, go uh, basically work in the laboratory. Of course, they must have proper training and um, supervision. Now, here is a BSL-1 laboratory. So, as you can see here, you have here controlled access. Although this is um, not that record. But then again, uh, BSL-1, of course, you, it's, not, it's not really open to general public. So, we have a hand washing sink. You have a sharps hazard and a warning how to handle the sharps. So, you have a proper PPA. And the proper PPA for BSL-1 is just a lab. A laboratory coat, you must have closed shoes and uh, long pants. So basically, no skin must be showing down uh, in from the leg region downwards, and even in the upper region. So only your head must not, only your head must be uncovered. So you must also wear gloves and uh, goggles, okay, or safety safety glasses, and then. You have a laboratory bench. So the laboratory bench, uh, a BSC, a biosafety cabinet is not required. So you can do an op simple open, uh, open top workbench, or you can actually do it in a laminar hood.
So, autoclave is desirable but not necessarily required. So, here is your basically autoclave. Next, for biosafety level 2. So, BSL-2 is suitable work for involving agents that pose moderate hazards to personal environment. So, basically, this is risk group 2. So, what are the differences between BSL-1? So, uh, the, the personnel must have specific training in handling pathogenic agents and are supervised by scientists competent in handling infectious agents and associated procedures. The access to the laboratory is restricted when work is being conducted, and all procedures in which infectious aerosols or splashes may be created are conducted in BSCs and other physical containment equipment. So basically, starting BSL-2, you need to have a biosafety cabinet. So here is BSL-2. So same, same with a BSL-1, you have controlled access, you have a cleaning, hand-washing sink, and sharps hazards warning. And then aside from that, you have an additional biosafety cabinet. So, depending on what pathogen are using, we have class 1, class 2, and class 3 cabinets. So, usually for BSL-2, it's either class 1 or class 2. And then we have, uh, of course, the PPA, same as BSL-1. And you can actually do some work on the laboratory bench as long as it's not uh, involving the pathogen. So, anything involving the pathogen must be done inside the BSCs. But if you're just preparing culture media, I'll just use this open-top workbench. And then you have a required autoclave in the laboratory. Now, BSL-3. Uh, BSL-3 is applicable to clinical, diagnostic, teaching, research, or production facilities where work is performed with indigenous or exotic agents that may cause serious or potentially lethal disease through the inhalation route of exposure. Laboratory personnel must receive specific training in handling pathogenic and potentially lethal agents and must be supervised by scientists competent in handling infectious agents and associated procedures. So basically here is your BSL level 3. So in BSL 3, you must have an airtight uh, laboratory which is basically required for uh, especially when you are disinfecting the lab. Now, um, because remember, airflow is being controlled here. Now, we have here, of course, a self-closing double door access. Why is it a self-closing access? So, basically, of course, you need to have the door always closed. That's one. Another one is uh, sometimes scientists uh, enter the lab with uh, things on both of their hands. So, it's very difficult to actually close them. And sometimes they tend to forget to close the, the door. And of course, the access here must be controlled. And then you have a personal shower going outside the laboratory. So basically, the entryway and the exit uh, can be shared. Here is your gray area. So you have a shower here. And then the outside, the door to the outside of the lab. So basically, you have a double door here. And then uh, you have your sharps hazards, a hand washing sink. And in the hand washing sink, that must be uh, sealed. Uh, basically sealed penetrations so the hand washing sink must be um, basically you must have uh, proper because the effluent must be properly uh, uh, sanitized or cleaned up and then you have a physical containment device your biosafety cabinet you have your uh, PPA so the PPA in BSL-3 is a bit different so this uh, this case is a bit um, recommended but not really required. Although the PPA here you will need to have, aside from the lab, lab coat, you need to have the um, the overalls, this is the safety, the PPA safety overalls, as well as a a, a face shield. But uh, it can also be a powered air purifying respirator. So that means. Your air, the air supply is not from the outside or the ambient air, but it's personally supplied. It can be supplied uh, through an es respirator carried at the back. So it's like a backpack at the back that purifies the air that you breathe. So you have a, a air purifying respirator uh, in your back. And then you have a laboratory workbench and an autoclave. So aside from that, of course, because the air here is being uh, controlled and sanitized as well, uh, there must be an exhaust HEPA filter. So, exhaust air from the lab is filtered by a HEPA filter. And the effluents 
from the sink must be uh, deco uh, there must be a proper decontamination facility for that. So this is BSL three. Now this is also another view of a biosafety laboratory three. So here you will see here although they are not using the air powered respirator, but the individuals have um, they ha aside from the general um, coats, they have special um, overalls, and then they have um, hair. Uh, uh, parang shower cups. It's similar to shower cups, not actually shower cups. It's basically uh, headgears and uh, additional is a face shield. And then, uh, what I want you to see here is a double door entry. So, you have an entry for a sh sanitizing shower before you actually access the, uh, the facility. And now, we have BSL-4, which is the maximum containment laboratory. This is the highest containment laboratory that we have. So they are required for work with dangerous and exotic agents that pose a high individual risk of aerosol transmitted laboratory infections and life-threatening disease that is frequently fatal for which there are no vaccines or treatments or related agents of unknown risk of transmission. Actually, when you have a biological agent that you are not sure whether it is pathogenic or not, the, the SOP treatment for that is you automatically think of it as a risk for agent. Although... It is you are still not sure there is a little to know whether it's the risk whether that agent is pathogenic or not it, since it is an unknown agent you automatically attribute it as a risk for the highest uh, risk group and handle it based on a risk for group basically you need to handle it using the highest biosafety level or highest containment that you have so agents with close or identical antigenic relationship to agents requiring bsl for containment must be handled at this level until sufficient data are obtained either to confirm continued work at this level or redesignate the level. So, uh, uh, the more that you learn about it, the more, of course, you can lower the level if it's uh, desirable or if it's actually appropriate to lower the level or not. So, laboratory staff must have specific and thorough training in handling extremely hazardous infectious agents. Laboratory staff must also understand the primary and secondary containment functions of standard and special practices, containment equipment, and laboratory design characteristics. So, all laboratory staff and supervisors must be competent in handling agents and procedures required, requiring the BSL-4 containment. And, of course, the supervisor, in accordance with the institutional facility, must be able to control the access to the lab. Not anyone can enter the lab. And here is a BSL-4 lab. So you have here two-way access, um, basically an entryway and an exit. And uh, you have your, again, self-closing double door con with controlled access. You have your sharps hazard. You have a hand-washing sink. You have sealed uh, the, this, the outlets, all, all of the outlets or water supply must be sealed, uh, properly sealed uh, to prevent it from basically leaks. So you have physical containment device. Ah, by the way, sealed penetrations because what if um, you wash off as an agent that can uh, basically be corrosive or say it's a rather sharp agent so it might uh, puncture the pipes. Then you have the physical containment by safety cabinets. For BSL-4, usually use BSC class 2 or class 3. And then we have a positive pressure protective suit. So here is uh, basically it's like an astronaut suit. All of uh, you have an umbilical cord that supplies air, and it's in a positive pressure, so that in case of um, which uh, usually this is uh, this is difficult to um, it's rather an unavoidable risk. In case that your suit is punctured, you will know immediately if your suit is punctured and. Uh, it also prevents um, the, vi the pathogen from entering your suit. So once, because once you are, uh, once the virus entered or the pathogen entered your suit, basically the person is compromised. And then you have a laboratory workbench, of course, an autoclave, and then you have a chemical shower going out and your personal shower going out as well. So basically going in, there's a separate door for the, the for going in and for the entry and the, exit so for exiting you need to first uh, disinfect your suit and then take a shower just to be sure 
And then there's a required supply exhaust type of filters and a required effluent decontamination system. And of course, the whole laboratory must be airtight. So this is for BSL-4. So as you can see here, BSL-4, you are you want to uh, you, you really want to isolate the pathogen from the environment and of course from the personnel working in the laboratory so the idea here is um, implementing these facilities you want basically what is the level or surety of isolation in bsl4 you you absolutely do not want the pathogen from exiting the lab or escaping the laboratory and or and as well as um, infecting your personnel okay so in the next uh, set of this video we will talk about biosafety cabinets